the next generation, inspiring the next generation. And we read that from Deuteronomy, Marty did, from Deuteronomy chapter 4, of passing the word on to your sons and their sons and grandchildren. And this would go for daughters and granddaughters as well. That's just the way it was written at the particular time. Passing this information on to your children to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord uh, in a uh, in a not so positive culture. Ephesians chapter uh, chapter six, Ephesians six, verse one. It says, "Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right." Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Father, we ask that you would bless the Word this morning, bless the truth this morning. And Father, we want you to know that we want to wish you a happy Father's Day. Uh, for your children, this one included. Thank you for being my Heavenly Father, as we all thank you for being our Heavenly Father through Christ Jesus our Lord. Your love shown to us is more than we can take in. It's more than we can comprehend, but we need to spend our lives, Father, trying to comprehend just how much you do care for us. Just how patient, merciful, kind, and gracious and giving you are as our Heavenly Father. Just thank you for that today. Thank you for our Savior Jesus Christ who shed His blood on the cross of Calvary that, Father, you love the world so much that you sent Him to die for our sins that we might be reconciled to you through His shed blood on the cross of Calvary. Thank you for that blessed gift, Father. And thank you for waiting patiently for us. And then when our time comes, taking us on to glory to spend eternity with you. We thank you for that promise, Father. There's so many things that you promised that we have yet to experience, but they're already ours because you've already said it and that settles it. Thank you now for each one that's come out here today. We ask you to bless them. We ask you to bless the fathers in this church, grandfathers in this church, that you'll bless them, and of course the mothers as well. Father, we ask you to bless the fathers of our nation, that they will see the benefit of, of bringing up their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. We need that movement, Father, before our nation crumbles, before people forget their heritage, not just American heritage, but primarily Christian heritage. Thank you now for all we have in Christ, and thank you for this time together. In His name we pray and give thanks. Amen. All right, we're going to leave this microphone on as long as it's working. I've got the other one if I have to change over, but... This one here, I guess, is is working. Sounds like it might be. I'm going to share something with you. There are no perfect, perfect fathers. There are no sinless fathers, including this pastor. And I know this statement may come as a shock to you, but let me preach on it. I always like it when someone is around a group of people, whether it's a, or sitting at a table or they're in a, in a crowd somewhere, and someone says something that is the obvious, speaks to the elephant in the room, as the saying goes, and somebody will shout from the back, Preach! Preach it! <laughs> well, it's true. So, there are no perfect fathers. No sinless fathers. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 says though, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. How many times have we fathers read this and said, I want to do that. I'm trying to do that. I know I can do better. I wish or looking back after you raised your children, maybe said, I wish I would have done a better job job of carrying out this command. Paul speaks in Ephesians chapter 5 of the times fathers 
lived in during Paul's day. And evil was everywhere as it's shown in chapter 5 because Paul tells them that all kinds of bad stuff was going on in the Roman culture in that day. Evil in that day was everywhere. Immorality was rampant and it was infectious and it did have a strong influence on the young people of that day. And the exhortations to refrain from an evil and immoral life are numerous in Ephesians chapter 5. That's what leads up to the exhortation in chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 regarding children obeying their parents, honoring their mother and their fathers, that it may be well with them. And then a little extra is given in Ephesians 4, 6 of fathers not poking their children with a stick, as it were, using a metaphor, I guess. But Ephesians chapter 5, if you'll just turn back just for the first several verses there, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in virtue, agape, unconditional love. Agape means unconditional love. Walk, or the word peripateo in the word there, walk, that means to conduct your lifestyle as a lifestyle of love. And one of the things that we brought out that was very significant in the first hour in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we're talking about the attributes of God, and in particular we brought out some about the love of God and what God's love looks like in us. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, gives a litany of examples of what love looks like. Things that you do, things that you don't do. And it's a demonstration of a unconditional divine love and that unconditional divine love that God wants us to, to emulate and to illustrate and to practice is greater than any spiritual gift, greater than any uh, thing that you can brag on, greater than having great faith. Some people have great faith, great resolve, great determination, great skill, great spiritual gifts. They'll go all over the world for God or they'll do a great job on their, with their employer for God. I mean, it does, it, that does count just as much in God's eyes. They'll, they'll have great faith to do things uh, when it seems like they don't have it to do with. Sometimes giving when they feel like I, I don't know that I've got these bills, I've got this, but I know that I've got obligations to God here too. Uh, we, we have done that, we understand. You have done that, you understand. But Paul said, if you and I do not have agape love, all that means squat, just to put it bluntly. Great preaching, great preacher, great writer, great song person, great illustrator, great leader of organizations and say for the church or whatever, know how to get a bunch together and keep them together and that's great administrative skills which some have more than others. But no love. No unconditional love. Impatient, prickly, unforgiving, discourteous, rude, foul mouth, at least not in the pulpit, but out of the pulpit. Bitter, unforgiving, maligning, impatient. All those things seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4-8. through 8, These things are the things that God wants us to improve upon. Things that we are not as strong as we ought to be to put it mildly sometimes. And so, there is a good way for us to get, gauge how we're getting along with regard to our impact on our family, our impact on society, our impact for God on our family. If I say I'm having a good day it's because I rolled in a potload of money, because I told somebody off, because I got my way, I went out to me, that's temporal. And that's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. That's all temporary stuff. 
It doesn't bring you any eternal reward. And it goes with you with the grave. But in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8, Paul brings out things that you can look at and that if you are working on and God is working on you to make that become a reality in your life, there's a demonstration to you, self-evident demonstration to you and I, that we are maturing in the faith and we are honorable to the Lord. And it will be a great payday when we go to be with the Lord. And that is a payday that will never run out. That's a payday that does not have an expiration date. Your paycheck has an expiration. What is that? When your money runs out. And so you work and you get more. And I work and I get more. Whatever. But when that runs out, you've got to go get more. When you get to heaven, your payday will never run out. You say, well, I don't want much when I get to heaven. Well, that shows how much you thought of Christ while you were here on the earth. That's the, that's the problem. You see, when we get to heaven, it's because He did for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. When we get our rewards, it's what He couldn't do for us that we needed to do for Him. He can't make you the Christian that you ought to be unless you're willing to give yourself to that. And that is sacrificial. On your part, my part as well. That's part of growing. And this is something that love demonstrates to our families. It demonstrates it because it's a natural outflowing of our learning to walk with God. And we're all in that learning phase. Don't get me wrong. None of us have arrived. We are all in that phase, are we not? We're all learning. We stumble sometimes. We get up and we go. And that's the main thing is that we get back up and we keep going. You failed your family, I failed my family at times. But you don't quit your family. You just keep on keeping on. That's the way it goes, unless they quit you. And you can only just hold on for so long. As a Christian, we try to hold on as long as we can. God bless you for doing so. How many times have fathers read, Fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord? Fathers may have said, I wish... I could have done, I would have done better. And Paul speaks in Ephesians 5, as we're reading here, that evil was everywhere. He says in verse 2, walk in love as Christ has also loved us, given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. In other words, a sacrificial offer was given with a, with a, with the incense and such back in the day. But fornication, this is something that Paul is trying to pass on to the church at Ephesus, of which the Apostle John, who wrote the book of Revelation, along with the Gospel of John and 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he was a pastor at Ephesus. He was a pastor at Ephesus when he was sent out into exile on the Isle of Patmos and wrote the book of Revelation. Ephesus is a long ways from where he was sent out to Patmos with. And then Timothy was also a pastor. Young Timothy, the 1st, 2nd Timothy that Paul wrote to, the pastoral epistles. Timothy was a pastor at Ephesus at one time. So they had some high-profile preachers in their churches. These were One was an apostle and the other was close to it. But fornication, all uncleanness and covetousness, which is in the culture of the day that Paul was writing this letter. No different than the day. Fathers dealt with the same things then as fathers are still dealing with the day, which is sin and evil. But fornication, all uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not be named among you as becoming saints, neither filthiness, or foolish talking, nor jesting, that's called getting the bird back in that day, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For you know that no fornicator, or unclean person, or covetous person who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience. But be not therefore partakers with them. You were once in darkness, but now you are in light as a Christian. So walk as children of light. And he's trying to encourage the fathers uh, and all, the, all, the, all those there to follow the example of God's word. Because the culture they lived in was not... Any different than the culture we live in today. If, there, if not, theirs was probably even more pagan than ours is today. He says in Galatians 5 that the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh in verses 16 and 17 of Galatians 5. And this truth is echoed over and over in Ephesians 5, 1 through 11, where the flesh says, fornicate. 
The flesh says, be unclean. It says, be covetous. It says, be filthy. It says, talk foolishly or jesting. And it also says, add your two cents worth when others are talking. The flesh goes on to say in Ephesians 5, 11, fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. But the Spirit, God says, the opposite of these things. So bringing our children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord means that we teach the opposite of the things that our culture sometimes throws upon us. We are instead told to walk in love or virtue love. And go back to 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 8 and just take a look look at that on your own during the week as I must as well and see where I can do better. I know I can always do better. I'm not asking you to agree with me. I'm just saying I know I can. And you can say the same for yourselves. He also says uh, that we are told to walk in Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 2, we are to walk in love. And in verse 8 of Ephesians chapter 5, at the end of verse 8, he says, walk as children of light. We're to walk as children of light. And then in verse 15, he says of Ephesians 5, then see then that you walk circumspectly or upright in God's eyes, not as fools, but as wise. That's what circumspectly means, the work to walk an accurate Christian walk. So there is a clear differentiation as to how the Christian is to walk as opposed to how the world walks. And the fathers are to be the examples to instruct their children in these walks. Children will listen more to what you do than to what you say. Please understand that the Galatians as well as the Ephesian youth came up in a pagan Roman society. The Roman government was strong on patriotism. They were very strong on patriotism. And we can check that box off because, you know, it's popular among conservatives or Christian going church going people to be patriotic. We even got a flag in our assembly here. The Roman government was strong on patriotism. And so fathers pushed that. Uh, Roman government was strong on expansion of national holdings and growth of wealth. So we, we like money, yeah. Yeah, show your children that. Uh, the Roman government was strong about allegiance, again, to political and military leaders, was strongly promoted, and at times, of course in their time, it was enforced. However, patriotism and national interest to Rome was not in the business of promoting morality. Now, we do have laws on the books that are very moral laws, thank goodness. And they did have some that were very moral and right as far as justice and fairness goes. Yes, that was true. But they were very much involved in pagan idolatry. And the state had sponsored many pagan gods and goddesses. And so it was all right as long as you were a part of the, because it helped their financial structure. Because a lot of the money that was generated in Rome was money that was spent at the idolatry houses, uh, the shambles as it was called in Corinth down there. As money was spent on uh, all the temples, money was spent on, uh, and the government helped subsidize a lot of that back in the day. And the government helped subsidize the pagan a society that uh, the people lived in. It kept them pretty much entertained. And that's what Rome was about, was keeping the people uh, entertained to keep them loyal. And if that entertainment involves some debauchery, well, we don't worry too much about that. That's all a part of the fun. Fun for who? But it did not promote anything to do with Christian teaching, of course. Hostility to Christians was not just the work of people who wanted more human bloodshed in the circus or the arena. Hostility to Christians, uh, it had a, a rational, conservative basis. It was probably uh, the standard to be hostile to Christians. By 100 A.D., the anti-Christian movement essentially rested on the widespread spread popular feeling that some corrupting internal force was at work to undermine the traditional cultural values of Rome. 
And so often Christianity clashed with the cultural values of its day, of its day with regard to Rome, and oftentimes the values was to see as a stifling epidemic against the fun filled lifestyle that the Roman government wanted its people to experience. And remember the the emperor was considered deity considered one to be worshipped, and so there was not to be any one to be higher than the government. And the government was the, was the law. And if you worship that leader, you in essence obeyed and worshipped that government without question. Christians were an affront to the national interest of the Roman Empire. We, we were. Our forefathers were an affront to the national interest. And Christians were deemed in that day undesirable. Undesirable. Christians were a force that undermined the heathen goddess culture of that day. Entertainment was not focused on virtue and fidelity so much as it was an allegiance to Rome. Debauchery and vice made the headlines in the theaters then, just as it does here today. Christians who spoke of sins and a judgment day of answering to a single God after death, of serving a resurrected Savior whom the Roman government sponsored his killing, they were despised and they were persecuted by the Roman culture Paul, who was once Saul of Tarsus, was a part of that roundup program. The Romans had their gods and goddesses, and they wanted no one telling them they had to answer to a singular Christian god. And when I hear the foulness that goes on, like at the national awards assemblies for whatever it was, like it was the last week, and the things that have gone on before, because those people live in a completely different world than the Christian lives in. They are, they are so blind to their debauchery and their foulness that they can put on a nice suit. And as the old saying goes, you can put perfume on a pig and it's still a pig. You put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. And those people can get up with those nice suits on or the ladies wear their fancy outfits. And they've got more millions of dollars. You could buy, a, when you get a house full of these high dollar actors and these celebrities together, you could buy a small country for what they're worth. Because the, the debauchery and the foulness that they put out there, because these people for the most part have sold their souls to the devil. The stuff that they will do and the stuff that they will say in front of God and the whole world, they have to be so callous to the reality that there is a living God who is going to judge them that they work for no one but the devil himself. And he is incarnate in all these big moguls and these Harvey Weinsteins and all these people who are the big shots. Paul called them out by name in his day, and I'll do the same thing. These people have sold their souls to the devil. And they'll say and do anything. And if you believe that there is a moral value to innocence for the young girl and the young guy, that there is a moral value to the married woman and the married man, that there's a moral value to dressing decently and talking decently, you are considered to be a stain on their industry. That's the way it was in Roman culture. That's exactly how it was. I don't know if you watched any of this this fighting where the men get into the ring and they beat the pulp, beat and kick the pulp, pulp, beat the blood and the, out of the other person until they tap out or whatever. Used to be they had the wrestling and they had all this other stuff. This is not wrestling. This is just brutal beating the you-know-what out of the next person until they submit. And the women do it too. We are getting back to the days of the Roman culture. And I want to remind all of us here that the 
the government that will be primary uh, to the Antichrist will be a part of what is known as the revived Roman Empire. The ten toes on the image of Daniel. That in the last days, it will be as it was during the Roman Empire. And the culture of nations who are sponsoring Christian values. So, children can be greatly influenced to make a big deal out of... And parents can be a big influence on making a big deal out of godless characters. I shouldn't say godless, heathen characters. They have a God. It's money, power, whatever. Sex, drugs. So needless to say, a Christian family, and in particular as we look at Father's Day, the Christian fathers of that day had a lot stacked against them in trying to influence their young children, boys and girls, to... Yeah, that might be fast money. Yeah, that might be this. It might be that. And it may be cool at school. But look what it's doing to your conscience. Look what it's doing to your core values. Look what it's going to do with regard to your meeting your Creator at the end of your life. Their children were strongly advised and influenced by their peers as well as their culture to live the Roman way. They saw the scorn and shame that would come to them if they expressed their Christian upbringing among their peers in the towns, in the cities, the countryside. When there would be a national day of celebration of something, they were expected to be there. And so if they had Christian salvation and Christian teaching, many of the young people, and the parents as well, hid their teaching so that they would blend in with their culture. Because they didn't want to feel like an outcast. Paul did not go along with that. Can you imagine how much stronger Christianity would be if we would all speak up instead of just a few? Do you imagine? There are more Christians, and it, we typically find out when it's an election, don't we? That there are a lot of secret, silent disciples of the Lord out there because otherwise a lot of the stuff that's being put out there to be voted on to become law in our land, and though some of it already has been, but much of that by judges who are run amok. There are so many things that would be different if we would speak up at the grassroots level. We don't have to go have a big scene and have a big rally, but we would just speak up at the grassroots level. There are people who might go to Washington, D.C. and get in a big crowd to cheer for something that is good and noble and righteous, but they wouldn't open their mouth if their face was on fire sitting right across the table from a relative who was just spewing out all kinds of junk or at work. It's easier to be strong when you are in a crowd than it is when you are by yourself. There's something about the anonymity of being in a crowd that gives people courage. But you need that courage when you go home. You need that courage when you're sitting there with your children. You need that courage when you are at the job or you're at the marketplace. You need that courage then. Because that is only when you and I have an effect. Nobody really changes because there's a march that goes on in D.C. It's when there is a mouth of righteousness that's speaking at the kitchen table. That's when there's effect on lives. And not only is speaking it, but living it. Being kind to your spouse is one of the greatest ways for children to learn to be kind to their spouses. Being respectful is what they learn from you, your example, not what you say. You can give them 15 Bibles while they're growing up, but if they don't see it, it's going to not be instinctive to follow. Their instinct is going to be to follow their example, not so much what you say. That goes in one ear and out the other. Like, did you wash your feet before you went to bed? Yes, ma'am. Because that's what I'm supposed to say. Until she finds out you didn't. Too often... The youth of Paul's day did as they did back in Solomon's day as seen in Proverbs 1 and verse 10 where it says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Instead, their children, as do so many of today's children, including Christian children, cast in their lot among the sinners 
and their feet swiftly run to evil. The strong influence from their peers and their culture makes it harder on their parents to inspire their own children. And unfortunately, many in that day gave into the culture of their children. And so often you see people who are adults who are trying to act like they're 13 years old again. Young men trying to be cool like they're 15. I mean, older men, middle-aged men acting like they're 13 years old again. Middle-aged women acting like they're 16, going to a prom or something. Two kids on the hip and a cart in front of them going through Walmart, but they've got to get the stuff together because they're going out after the kids go to sleep or whatever. And no one get me going on the Walmart thing. My wife says, just leave that alone. Because I go there too. You know, I'm a person who likes to observe people. Because there's nothing more entertaining than watching people. <laughs> so when you get tired of the stuff that's on TV, just go somewhere and that's in a local area and just kind of sit and just kind of watch or just kind of, you know, they'll probably think you're up to no good, but I'm just saying. It's free entertainment. But in the persecutions of A.D. 249 to 251, Emperor Decius, the, uh, during his uh, reign, the apostasy of an overwhelming majority in a Christian congregation was not frequent. Not infrequent, excuse me. The apostasy was pretty bad among the Christian church during uh, this particular emperor's reign. Of course, through Domitian, it was really bad. That's when John was in. Nero, of course. But Domitian, Trajan, but Domitian was really, he was a wicked, wicked man. He, he, he loved to put people in pain. And uh, Decius, um, he was not much better. But the apostasy was overwhelming uh, among the majority of Christians uh, in that day. They had given in to their culture. Christian values were undermined by the culture of that day so much so that dedication and suffering for Christ seemed useless because by that time, in church history, by that time, there had been so many men and women of faith who are martyred uh, by their government or by national uh, government rule and leadership that it had pretty much quietened the church down. It, it for, for a short while, it inspired the church to be more faithful until Nero decided that he was going to use people for human torches and he put them on poles and he lit them on fire at nighttime as they walked up to the area to where he had his 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 own theater production going on, which he was a terrible actor. He thought he was wonderful. He was very narcissistic. And he, the Christians saw so many Christians being martyred for the faith and no relief from God that they finally just blended in with their counterparts in the Roman government and they suffered for it because the church went into such apostasy that it was taken over by religion only. That was the Roman Catholic Church under Constantine, which was where it was developed under Constantine. However, it would be dedicated. Sometimes martyred parents who would inspire the next generation to be godly and to carry on the truth of the gospel of Christ. Christianity has a heritage of great men and women of God who stuck with the word of God in the midst of of tremendous persecution. It does. Some of their children have turned from the Word, but some have followed in the faith footsteps of their godly parent or parents. And some had not had godly parents, but good parents, and but they turned to faith. Thank goodness this has continued for the past 2,000 years, and we are still here as, as, uh, as a church, and we are still here in America. And we fathers are still battling the same battles the fathers battled in the first century. So fathers, the best we can do then is at looking at Ephesians 6, 4, is not only to uh, be a good parent, to be a good spouse if we are married, but fathers, in particular, he says in verse 4, provoke not your children to wrath. In other words, do not be unreasonable in your demands. That's what that means. Or outrageous in our punishments. That's what this means. Or inconsistent in our examples. 
That's what provoking not our children to wrath means. In other words, we're telling them one thing with our mouth, but we're showing something else with our actions. We need to have our hearts under control so that we will have our actions under control. And we swallow hard at times because we know we don't. So we're not to be unreasonable in our demands. We're not to be outrageous in our punishments. We are not to be inconsistent with our examples, our rules, and our controls. Don't ask you to control yourself if I can't control mine. Be fair with your children. In other words, as God is fair with you and I as fathers. Be fair with your children as God is fair with you. And be consistent in your duties as a parent. That is critical to the stability and the happiness of a child. And for goodness sakes, never show favoritism to any of your children. Because our Father in Heaven, who is our supreme example, never shows favoritism to us. Never show favoritism to any of your children. You don't let them get away with anything, but you don't show favoritism and show one more love than the other. Provoke not our, your children to wrath. The word wrath is the Greek word paro, gizmos, P-A-R-O-G-I-S, G-I-Z-M-O-S. And it means exasperation and embitterment. What's that mean? Do not push your children into an emotional corner of which they cannot come out. Do not push your children into a, an emotional corner of which they cannot come out because it makes no difference how mad and how upset they get with what you're doing to them. They can't do anything about it. See, instructing children is, is not just about us getting our way. It's about us helping and nurturing our children. Colossians 3.21 says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Disheartened, in other words. Give up itis. Yes, there may be the case where you have a child that is compliable, compliant, but broken. That's too much. Yes, discipline. They're going to mess up again. Yes, discipline. They're never going to stop messing up. Guess what? You aren't either. The only difference is you're a lot bigger than them. Now, they to be learned to respect. Respect can be brought forth a lot of different ways. And yes, sometimes it does take the combination of things to do it. That's obvious. And the Bible definitely says so. They may be children, but they are 100% human. They're little humans. And they're mentally little humans, but they are 100% humans and they are growing. And you're not. They're going to catch up. And your joy is that they will advance whatever you have succeeded in in life. And the greatest thing that you want to see is that they treat others kindly. They're a good friend to their friends. They're a good spouse to their spouse. They're a hard-working employee. They are faithful to their duties. And hopefully one day be faithful to their duties to God as well. They may be children, but they are 100% people. And sooner or later, they will come out fighting. They will come out fighting. And they have their own way of showing it. They have their own way of showing it. The Bible says in Hebrews 10.24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Not unto anger or wrath, but we are to consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You must show them the way they should go by your life, not just by your words. But you cannot make them go the way they should. The Bible says bring up a child in the way that he should go, and when he is older he'll not depart. It doesn't say how old. <laughs> you may be dead before they get turned around. You don't ever know. But show them the way that they should go. You can't make them. Show them the way that they should go by your life. They're not always going to be small. They're not always going to be at home. They're going to be gone. Encourage them to do the right thing, 
to live the right way by your example, then by your words. And then hopefully, turn them to the Lord for direction that they will need when they're no longer under your roof. When my children left home, I said to the Lord, they're in your hands now. I can't do anymore. They're in your hands now. Bless them and watch over them. And then it says here to bring them up, we're closing, to bring your children up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Keep the word of the Lord present and visibly placed before your children in the home. Deuteronomy 6 verses 6 through 14 says to teach the word to your children, write it upon the doorpost of your house. You see, reminders of God's love and direction need to be everywhere in the home. They need to be everywhere in the home. What's bad is when you have a cross in the dining room and you have Metallica posters in the bedrooms. That's bad because somewhere or another the connection is not getting across. It is good for both parents and children. Good for both parents and children to have reminders somewhere around the home of the presence of God, whether it's a a little picture with a verse on it or whatever. These are good little reminders to have. They had it back in the day for the children and the parents back in the day. They would wear them on their person. They would have them little pieces of vellum. And they'd have little verses of Scripture on them. And they would roll them up. And they had little things that some of them would wear. And it actually fit in the little... You know, we had the light where you Spurlunkers used to use them. And everybody has them now. A little light here where they had a little box here. And they would wear them. And sometimes they'd have the box on their arm. And the ladies would have things. And they'd have little pieces of Scripture in it. And they'd have it out. And they had certain times that they would take it out in their prayer time. And they would read it. But it was a reminder. And you could put something in your house. Maybe not come in and walk, going to work with a box strapped to your head or something like that. Or you just get you some duct tape and a, a Gideon's New Testament and do like this. That's not what we're talking about doing. But the idea is to have... Now, that would be something, wouldn't it? <laughs> what? It's a reminder of God's love and direction that we all need, mom, dad, and kids. It's good for both parents and children. The Bible is clear that a child left unto himself will bring his mother to shame. Proverbs 29 and verse 15. If you let a kid raise themselves and set their own values and own standards, they don't have any. You didn't have any. You had to get some guidance from someone. Hopefully you got good guidance. Child left unto himself will bring his mother to shame. Proverbs 29, 17. A child that is corrected shall give rest and delight to their parent's soul. Corrected. It doesn't mean beat, beaten. It means corrected. Corrected. And let's not make it hard. Let's not make it hard for the children to be confused about what's right when we hear one thing but we see something else. Because that really confuses a kid because what you say is not their standard. What they see is their standard. A child that is corrected shall give rest and delight to their parent's soul. And I know everybody here wants what's right and best for their children. I know you do. I did too. Well, I still do, I guess. But America, as we spoke of earlier as we're closing, has unfortunately, though, I, I see it, maybe you see it, uh, returned to the practices of Roman paganism. As fathers and grandfathers, we have an awesome responsibility. And mothers and grandmothers have an awesome responsibility to steer children and grandchildren away from the vile media that spews out its corruption on our families. It does have an effect on them. You are what you eat, and your mind is what it takes in. Your heart is what your mind takes in. So you may have a good, healthy body. You may eat all natural, good foods. But what is your heart eating, spiritually speaking? And what are we letting our children be fed? Because it will come back to create conflict. Fathers, let us stand in the Word. Let us lead our families in godly wisdom and in love, for goodness sakes. In love. Not always shown with affection, sometimes with sternness. Mothers and fathers both. 
but love that is shown for doing what is best and primarily not making it hard for the child to know right from wrong when we say one thing and we live another way. Try to make it where we're consistent. Try to make it where we understand that they're just little people, but a 100% person. They may not be little. Some of your kids are, these kids in here are growing up quicker than you can imagine, aren't they? Yeah, you say, I just remember just the other day that he or she was just a little thing. We were carrying them around to the store and going here and going there. And now, all of a sudden, I'm looking up at them. My children, their children are growing, and my oldest child has two girls, and they're both taller than their mother. One's only 11 years old. I guess 11, something like that. Already taller than her mother. She's probably going to be taller than her sister before long, who's almost 16. 16 going on 30, as you know how that goes. Well, we'll go down and straighten them out. Sure. <laughs> no. But it is good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to have wisdom from God's Word for us. And we need that wisdom. You always wish as you get older that you would have done better. You wish that you would have taken more precautions. Uh, you think in the time, because you're in the heat of the battle. I, I get it. When you're raising children, you're in the heat of the battle. Dealing with uh, illness, dealing with school, dealing with behavior, dealing with their peers. It is full-time work. And just... Just know that we we are we are praying for you, parents, and those that aren't here but are hearing these tapes. We're praying for you, uh, fathers and mothers, uh, but that you will not let the culture of the day uh, become more impressive upon the minds of your children than God, because there's where they're going to find their peace when you're dead and gone. When you're not around, when they go off to college or go to their workplace or they get their first apartment down the road or on the other side of the world or the other side of the country, when that little boy or that little girl has finally become a teenager and you're proud of them and they've graduated and they've gone off to college or they've gone to work somewhere or whatever it might be that they, they've they got their head on straight and they got their heart in straight and they become a good friend to someone or a good spouse to someone and they have a full life that is not brought down with a callousness of, of guilt because of a lack of innocence. You want to try to keep that innocence in your children as long as you can. And you know that the world wants to corrupt that as quick as it can. When I see these young people that are trying out for America's Got Talent or these other shows that are on national television, and I think, oh, she's, a, she's such a pretty young, innocent girl. Or he's such a young, innocent young guy. I know that there are vultures out there in Hollywood and there are vultures even in that crowd and maybe even on that panel of judges who can't wait to debase that young girl or that young boy. Can't wait for them to get old enough to be legal so they don't go to jail for something corrupt that they're thinking about doing. Because that's the culture of Hollywood. That's the culture of the opera. That's the culture of the theater. And it's no longer just as in our society anymore, so much so that you've got the men preying on the women, you've got the men preying on the boy, young boys, and you've got the women who are powerful preying on the young girls. And so when I see these young kids that are really good singers and they're talented or whatever, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you're getting ready to go into a sewer pit. Find something noble to do with your life. We all like good music, but with that kind of music, many times comes the bad stuff. Hopefully, I hope it, I hope it gets cleaned up. I hope it does get cleaned up. And if the Me Too movement helps that, I'm not against that. I'm for that in that regard. That men should respect women. It's typically the women are not respected. It's important that there be respect. And fathers, if you want your sons to respect women, respect your wife. 
Because if you do not, he is not going to respect his girlfriend. He's not going to respect any women in his life. He's not going to respect if he gets married. He's not going to respect his wife. She's a second class citizen to him. That's not what you want. That's what nobody wants. And girls, same in your regard, honor yourself. Honor your virtue. Honor and protect yourself. Because without your mindset that you are the greatest influence on a child, that child will fail. There is no one that has a greater influence on their child than a mother and her caring, nurturing love. And that is something that we got to always remember. And her influence on a boy is actually stronger than the dad's influence on a young girl. Because psychologically, the mother, and this is not sexist, this is biblical, a mother is more naturally inclined to a, a nature with maternal instincts. Men do not have maternal instincts because they are men. They have paternal instincts. That's to provide to, and to protect. Mothers are to nurture and to be sensitive to. And a lot of times in family dynamics, it's so upside down today where the mother is to be macho and the man is to be feminine. And that is something that Satan has done to attack the family and to destroy, as it were, what comes natural to you as a man or a woman. And children are very blessed when they can have both. Not always do have mom and dad in the house, but they are so blessed to have both when you compliment one another. I wouldn't plan on saying all that, but I'll say it anyway. Compliment one another. God bless you. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day of life and for the blessings that you